My name is Brian Wish. I'm an entrepreneur, CEO, and Pathfinder. If I've learned anything in life, it's that self-discovery is a critical part of living intentionally, building meaningful relationships, and achieving the future we see for ourselves. In July of 2021, I sold all my possessions, headed west, and began a quest to live a fuller and more meaningful life. The experience helped me truly understand the power of a single moment. And through my conversations with leaders from all walks of life, I've seen how that one phone call, heartbreak, diagnosis, or lost job can transform the entire course of our lives. In this podcast, I sit down with entrepreneurs, influencers, and experts across industries to talk through the events that changed everything. Together, we'll relive the make or break decisions, hard conversations, periods of despair and hope, chance encounters, and everything that followed. Peter Sorokoff is the founder and CEO of SEER, a company that aims to solve business problems by applying behavioral science, allowing organizations to more accurately understand the behavior of customers, consumers, fans, donors, and voters. Peter's career began in the therapeutic environment, which informed his human-centric vision of marketing from the outset. Prior to the launch of SEER, Peter was the chief creative officer and EVP of brand for the Atlanta Hawks and Phillips Arena where he built an internal agency that changed the paradigm of sports partnerships with Coca-Cola, Anheuser-Busch, Diageo, Verizon, and FanDuel. Peter also led the repositioning and rebranding of the Hawks franchise and served as the design lead on the $200 million Experience First renovation of Philips Arena, where groundbreaking architecture fulfilled the needs of a millennial audience. His leadership created a $40 million Emory Courts practice facility the USA's first cohabited professional sports practice facility, human sports science lab, and sports medicine and orthopedic practice. Internationally, Peter has been a consultant on projects for the Olympics and the Australian sports marketplace. He's a much sought after marketing speaker on the national stage where audiences learn about how to market to the subconscious and how every brand should think of their customers as fans. Peter's approach epitomizes big picture thinking. He brings in 20 plus years of marketing and branding experience to the table in every interaction, leveraging his deep understanding of the human subconscious and the phenomenon of fandom. Peter, welcome to the One Away Show. How are you, sir? It's good to see you. Good to see you from uh, the other side of the coast, but uh, always a pleasure. I'm excited to do this and maybe learn some things about you I never have. Uh, what is the one away moment that you want to share with us today? There was something that was uh, very poignant that happened um, in my early 20s. You know, most people who know sort of the work we do today sort of know me from my background in sports they don't really know. And it's not that we hide it, but they just don't really know. I I actually started in a therapeutic environment and worked with drug addicted and alcoholic kids. I spent about four or five years um, in that space and um, deeply gratifying hard work. You hear horrible stories, you see horrible things, but then you also see these, you know, amazing miracles all at the same time. And there was a young man who was um, on my caseload and uh, he had, he had, you know, was doing actually really pretty well. He's about to graduate the program. Uh, the program, by the way, took, you know, anywhere between sort of like six months and a year. So this was not sort of like a 30 day, you know, kind of in and out sort of thing it was, I would say a, a very sort of deep therapeutic environment. He got towards the end of the program. He ended up graduating. His grandmother had been a big part of him uh, and his sort of recovery process with his mom and dad. And, you know, she was sort of there through the whole thing. And, and honestly, Brian, she was the kind of woman like old school. I'm going to date myself by saying this, but if you sort of flipped open a dictionary, right. And looked up the word grandma or grandmother, like there would be a sketch of her face next to the definition. She was just that lady. Everybody loved her. This guy ended up using again. Uh, and it was really ugly, he ended up going to her house one night and he, you know, wanted money and she did all the right things and said, you know, I'm not going to give you money because I know what you're going to do with this. And he basically went into the garage and found a ball peen hammer and he murdered her uh, with a hammer. It was 
extraordinarily jarring for me because I had already, you know, seen and heard a lot of things. Uh, but this was, you know, this was somebody on my caseload kind of thing, right? And this is somebody that I had spent months kind of, you know, working with and part of his recovery team. And my uh, executive director at that time, who's very much a mentor to me, in fact, still is today, uh, all these years later, um, I went in to see him to kind of debrief and to talk about this. And, you know, I was, I was really broken up by this. I was like really shaken by this. And I remember saying things to him like, you know, what did I miss and what did I do wrong? And, you know, what else could I have? And I was, you know, sort of expecting a more sympathetic kind of like, hey, you did everything you could. And you know what I mean? These things happen. And, and I got the exact opposite. I got lit on fire. Um, but I did not get lit on fire for what you might expect. I really got lit on fire for this idea of how dare you think that you're bigger than this, that you were somehow responsible because you didn't do something mm. to stop this from happening. You know, the, the context of the conversation was jarring enough this really kind of like reset my whole trajectory on how I looked at life and where I fit in life and what I, you know, am capable of impacting and, you know, how much of life I need to accept on life's terms because it's so much bigger than I am. Uh, and, you know, without getting into sort of the gory details, it really sort of also changed sort of my spiritual outlook on life as well in terms of like getting right-sized um, where I sort of fit and what I have to contribute both, you know, professionally and personally uh, in this world. So most people don't know that story. It's not one of those ones you kind of, you know, you know, volunteer right away when you meet somebody. Um, but, you know, like you said, you know, I've had a lot of conversations over the years and we sort of are, you know, in the way back machine. Um, but that that probably was the most poignant turning point in my life in terms of, you know, shifting my view of the world. When you shared the murder, what he did, I was thinking, you know, instantly of what you just shared, like what was my responsibility and role in this? And what could I have done different? And and the fact that you had a mentor and someone to say, look, this maybe this isn't your fault. And it's it's uh you're not responsible for this. It, I'm sure it was a, a huge relief. Yeah. And, you know, he, he was, he got me much more focused on your job is to carry a message, right? That's what you're here to do. Um, and it's that person's responsibility, whether or not they take the message or the, you know, the resources or, you know, what you're putting in front of them, like, you know, you're, you're not going to be responsible for that person. You're here to do a job and to do it to the best of your ability Sometimes horrible things like this happen, but frankly, you know, those are way outside of your sort of pay grade slash purview slash, you know, so on and so forth. So as a young guy at that time, who's, you know, really competitive and, you know, was an athlete and everything's about winning and doing things at a high level and sort of being able to control a lot of variables in your life and around you and, it really kind of blew a lot of that out of the water and forced me to sort of like reset, you know, how I was going to think about those things. Just again, moving forward as a young professional and ironically, you know, th that kind of experience really, and the other work that I had done in that space ended up being very, very useful and beneficial down the road in sports as crazy as that is because uh, you probably remember uh, when you were here in Atlanta, we had a superstar young hockey player who, you know, accidentally ended up killing his best friend, who was also one of our players in a car crash. Um, and it was very, very difficult for a lot of people in the organization to sort of like reconcile and how do we sort of move forward and as a business? How do we, you know, how do we message? And I don't mean like try to message around this, but we have to communicate about this. We have fans and should they be angry? Should they not be angry? And how do we remember the player who we lost and, and how do we treat the player who's still alive at the end of this? And uh, so again, not to turn this into, you know, this uh, this sort of 
hugely dark uh, sort of series of stories. I, I don't mean it in that way as much as I could have never expected that what he reframed for me at that time would be so useful in terms of how I would, you know, sort of manage crisis in retrospect, of course, was inevitable. I don't mean, you know, the way that that went down as much as, you know, the world is just sort of crisis after crisis in a lot of ways for people. Um, So it's really about how do we kind of manage these and not let everything seem so dark and negative, um, like you're just waiting for the next bad thing to happen. Uh, Because that's a really hard way to live. And it's certainly an impossible way to grow or run a business. Appreciate the context. I think you're right. Like it's all messaging, not to make it that simple, but you know, what, what do you do and how do you respond? Something that I was thinking about though, Peter, is is something I've always, uh, I think I've admired about you is the, the depth of the way you see things and how you create identities around things. But when you were working with this one case, or even at that, that job uh, where you're doing more of a therapeutic environment, helping people recover, maybe get on a good track in life, I have to imagine one there was there was like this emotional attachment to like helping them get get on their way and feeling like you have a role in that but then two i what i'm curious about is what were the day-to-day interactions the observations how are you helping them maybe reconstruct uh their own lives to maybe go out in the world and contribute positively what did that look like then uh a lot of what uh, we were doing is is identifying patterns and then helping you know that person that ident- identify this pattern in their life and then you know identifying it's one thing but then we've got to like do something about it right and you know kind of the the academic term is you know behavior modification right uh, we want to help this person sort of change the kind of behaviors they're doing but you really I don't think you can really do that until the person really sort of understands what that pattern is. Um, And by the way, again, ironically, or maybe not so much, like, you know, this is what we started to say, well, if this is so prevalent in individual people, right? And not just, by the way, alcoholics and drug addicts. I mean, this is, I mean, I think all of humanity suffers from a certain level of this, right? Um, It's just kind of like hardwired into our frailty. When I moved into sports, thinking about like, well, does this happen on mass with people? Mm. And can we kind of understand that and actually um, use this understanding to kind of create experiences, which by the way, is not really any different than what you're doing in that one-on-one environment with that person, right? And you're right, you know, and I should have said this earlier, it's a super emotive space, right? Because, you know, in those early days, there's just so much wreckage there, right? Damage to the family and damage that they've done to themselves and shame and guilt and just all of that stuff, which again is very human. But how do we kind of like normalize that so that you can kind of talk about it and, you know, start to recognize like, yeah, everybody has some version of this, not of the addiction and that behavior, but you know, a lot of time the addiction, like the using of whatever that thing was that, you know, took you away from feeling bad, um, whether it was drugs or alcohol or, you know, by the way, there's lots of other things people use, right? It's really about getting people comfortable and giving them tools to be comfortable in that emotional environment where like, yeah, you're going to feel sad sometimes. You're going to be frustrated and angry sometimes. You're going to feel guilt or shame or do things that, you know, you've got to go back and kind of like clean up and say sorry and then go be something different. So you're really at an individual level working with people on that and then helping them build new positive patterns around getting comfortable and used to doing that as their new way of living it's not really that different what we're doing today. We're just doing it at a a much sort of like bigger level with companies. I think, you know, what it's is sort of deeply gratifying for me is uh, inevitably a lot of times you end up having these kind of conversations with the client and they have questions, right? And, And sometimes they get comfortable because we're so comfortable in this space talking about these sorts of things because it's just real, right? And uh, that people will start opening up with some of this kind of stuff. And, you know, it just builds trust because at the end of the day, all of this that we're talking about, all of this 
is really comes down to this, this broader notion of trust. If you don't have trust in yourself, if you don't have any trust in people around you, uh, or if you've broken trust with everybody around you, then all of these sort of cascading bad things happen. And so, of course, what's the reverse answer to that in terms of how you build things back up? It's all about, you know, resurrecting this notion of and, and how do you build trust? By the way, this is what brands do. Right. They don't talk about it in this terms, but frankly, it's very much the same sort of like mechanical process. You just don't typically buy things from brands you don't trust. Right. And I think to your to your point, right, you, you talked about being an emotive experience. If you're you're playing such a critical role at a juncture in someone's life when they've been pained, I think what you said as well, there's an undercurrent to the addiction that drove it. And you're, you're kind of unbundling that for them to set them in a new direction. And so to get them to do that, you, you have to inherently build trust. Yeah. Uh, so it's fascinating that. How, how old were you when you did this? So I would have been in my early 20s then. Um, and uh, it was actually from that place that I transitioned into sports, not because I was looking to. Uh, I also had a small business that I was running at that time that I started when I was like 18 because um, I love cars and I could never afford the kind of cars at that time that I loved. So this was my way of sort of being around cars like that. We didn't use the term side hustle then, but it was 100% my side hustle. Again, sort of ironically, one of my clients in that business who was referred to me, you know, he had a car and um, I helped him sell it and it sold really fast and he got way more than he expected for it. And he said, this is amazing. You need to come work for me. And he was the president of a hockey team. So I was sort of left with his other, you know, to your point, kind of turning point moment of like, mm -hmm. gosh, do I really want to leave this space that there's so much purpose for me and this, you know, real sense of meaning for me in my work, working for a hockey team, especially when you're a Canadian kid who's played hockey his whole life, right? was kind of like, oh my gosh, this just seems like, I don't know how I can turn this down, but trying to reconcile those two things. And that same mentor, when I went to him and said, hey, you know, this thing has come up and, and I was sort of expecting him to kind of like, well, you know, I don't know, like, I think you're doing pretty good here. And we'd sure, he was like, you got to go. He's like, you got to do that. <laughs> so I was kind of like, wait a minute, are you trying to get rid of me? Uh, and he was like, no, he's like, the world is going to need, you know, passionate, purpose-driven, you know, people seeking meaning in all kinds of different spaces and places. You don't have to just be working on stuff like this to be able to find that professionally. Mm -hmm. And that was a revelation to me too, right? It was sort of like, what, really? Like, I could go be working for a professional hockey team and find the same kind of, you know, sense of purpose doing that than working with these, you know, these young people. And he was like, yes, you can. That honestly, as simple as that was, he was sort of my biggest champion and advocate for me to make that sort of professional shift in my life. Um, so he, he, you know, he's kind of that reoccurring person in my life who, uh, you know, even when I had the opportunity to come to Atlanta and, uh, you know, I said to him, because I was working for the Calgary Flames at that time. And, you know, this is everything a guy like me could have ever wanted in life. And uh, Atlanta came calling and I was like, gosh, I don't know. It's pretty far away and I don't know anybody there. and It's in the U.S. And he's like, you got to do it. And I was like, really? I got such a good thing with, you know, the Flames here in Calgary. He's like, no, he's like, you absolutely need to go do this. Uh, and he couldn't have been more right in every single one of those. But what I realized in retrospect, again, was how much I think all of us, I'll speak for myself, need a champion sometimes, right? To kind of like, you know, believe in us when we're not 100% sure we actually believe in ourselves enough to like make a decision like that and take a risk like that. And um, so, and again, had I not had the trust in that relationship, probably wouldn't have taken the advice so readily. Uh, but because he was, you know, such a sort of consistent presence in my in my early life like that, it was like, well, gosh, if he thinks I can move to Atlanta and be successful and do this, like, I'm going to do it. Uh, and literally, that's how I ended up in Atlanta. What you're doing right out of school or, you know, in your early 20s, 
you were really focused about meaning and, and how to take passion into what you were doing. How did, how were you able to bridge the gap and that meaning and bring that into sports? I think that you were thinking about meaning or purpose or this emotive connection early to drive in most in a way that most people I'd say in their early twenties are not. Were there any like childhood events, ways you were raised, things that you just did early on in your life, even before you took that job that drove you into something more purposeful or, or was it just kind of by happenstance where you started to thrown into an environment and develop that? I, I thought early, early on, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, so I think the idea of like helping people was kind of baked in um, pretty early for me. And I, I don't know that I ever really gave it that much thought. It, it was just sort of always, you know, kind of omnipresent that I was just going to be one of those people who, you know, was going to try to be helping other people. I also wouldn't say that it it kind of came with this really deep you know what I mean? Uh, super sort of like thoughtful, um, strategic kind of decision as much as it was just sort of like, yeah, this is this is probably what I'm going to do in my life. And I think, you know, when you're young like that, people are also kind of reinforcing those things. You know, your parents, you know, everybody would like you to be like a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, some noble profession. And so I think some of it was reinforced by that idea of like, oh, my gosh, yeah, if you were a doctor, that would be amazing. Right. Um, because that's a profession that culturally we hold up as, you know, good people do that and smart people do that and disciplined people do jobs like that. I think it had a lot to do with that kind of stuff early on. You know, when I got into that, you know, that very specific space of, you know, working you know, uh, in the addictions field, what I, what I think I quickly kind of came to terms with was I had some gifts in that space and some things, you know, I want to say came easy to me, but there were things that I could see and I could connect. And, you know, I had some success that made me feel like I can really do this. Like I'm good at this and I'm helping people. And that's why when, that horrible event happened, it blew all of that up. And it really kind of forced me at a way deeper level to kind of rethink why was I there? And why was I thinking these sorts of things? And was this really where I wanted to be? You know, because in that space as well, you know, kind of in the background was, if you're gonna really be in that world, you really need to, you know, get your bachelor's in psychology or you know, sociology or social work, and then you probably are going to do a master's and you're probably going to do a PhD if you're really going to commit to it. And in the back of my mind, I knew I didn't want to do those things. Um, and I think that mentor knew I didn't want to do those things either. Uh, so I think when, you know, this other hockey opportunity and sports opportunity popped up, I think he knew before I knew that that was probably the right place for me and that, you know, I'd be able to sort of take this experience and kind of move it into that other place and space and uh, make from it, you know, whatever I was going to make from it. Uh, it's hard to turn that off, Brian, right? When you have that view of things, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like if you've been in production, they're the worst guys and girls to go to movies with because they lean over and they're like, oh, you see that those two shots didn't match up or see that he wasn't wearing that jacket in the last shot. Right. And you're like, what really? Uh, and you're like, Oh my God, don't ruin it for me. Cause you, you know, you go to a movie, you don't go to like pick out those things, right. You just go to be entertained. But if you've been in production by the nature of knowing how the sausage is made, you see all that stuff uh, because you have a more critical eye, right. To that's been trained to that that critical eye in that training when I came into sports, I started watching crowds. What was it that they were responding to and why weren't they responding to other things? And why did they laugh and why did they ooh and why did they ah? Do you know what I mean? And, and there's this awesome thing in sports, right? Like when you see 18 or 20,000 people at a hockey game or a basketball game, or maybe 40,000 at a, at a baseball game, or frankly, 80 or a hundred thousand in a football game, all sort of synchronously without a cue, right? Gasp or jump up and yell, or it's a really, really powerful thing. And I just wanted to try to understand how do we make more of that happen? Right? Because that's clearly what they're coming for. 
and I started to sort of lean on the things that I had learned from that, you know, previous, that previous, I guess, career, if you want to call it that, or that space that I had been working in to start really wanting and trying to understand that and try to remake moments during a game that would sort of, you know, almost like emulate these big emotional highs that people would have. And, you know, we started playing with this idea of, well, when people are really down, right, what can we do to sort of like bring them from down at least to average, right? Or to just sort of like the mid. And we started playing with humor because, you know, most of us, that's what we do, right? If I run into you and you seem down, like most people, the first thing they'll do is tell some corny joke. Because if you kind of smile or laugh a little bit, I'm like, ah, see, I got you laughing a little bit, right? It's not all that bad. And we all do that, right? To try to like, because we're sort of uncomfortable with, you know, negative emotion. So instead of asking you like why you're down, I tell you a joke. <laughs> so not necessarily healthy, but that's mostly what we do. So we started playing with that in the sports environment to say, okay, uh, it's the second quarter. We're down by 20 right? Like no one wants to hear let's go Hawks, right? Or defense, defense. It's like, dude, we're down by 20, right? Like we've got to be more intuitively in touch with what the crowd's feeling right now. So that, you know, we're not insincere in what we're asking them to do by like chanting defense or make noise, right? Like, you know, I'll make noise. I'll make noise like walking out of here to beat parking. That's how I'll make noise right now. Um, and so this is where, again, we started trying to play with these different mechanisms that again, are just part of this humanistic view to say, okay, if we could get people to laugh, even though we're losing, we're not laughing at the team. We're not laughing about the fact that we're losing. You know, they're here for the next couple hours. They paid to be here how can we at least try to lift the emotive environment to something different than what it is right now? And then, oh my gosh, if something good happens and maybe we go on a 10 point run, then the, the gap from going from way down here to high is easier to deal with if you're like at least at the mid and you want to move people to this, you know, to this higher emotive uh, space again, right? Where they're willing to cheer like, oh my God, hope. 10 points in a row, we're still down by 10, but I think we could do it now. So all of that was really, really super fascinating to me, right? It kind of itched that same itch that um, that occurred in, in that previous environment. And then when I got to Atlanta, there was another really, really interesting thing that I saw. So as a Canadian in Atlanta, uh, it took a hot minute to kind of like get right with, I would just say sort of the different racial cultures and how they interact or frankly, how they don't interact, wanting to just sort of like understand all of that. But this amazing thing was just immediately on display for me at sporting events in Atlanta, which was in a lot of other spaces in town, you, you just didn't see the same kind of interaction that you did let's say at a game, you know, there could be somebody African-American sitting next to somebody white. It's clear that they don't know each other. So-and-so hits a three pointer. You see these two guys jump up and they high five. And then they kind of have this awkward moment, like, nah, I don't even know you. Right. But the awkward moment is an, Oh, you're white and I'm black or, Oh, you're gay and I'm straight or, Oh, I'm an atheist and you're, Muslim, right? Like it's not that kind of awkward. It's just this very, you know, sort of like at a very, very humanistic level, like, ah, sorry, I don't know you. Maybe that was too much. But then they'd laugh after. And then you would see this interaction if you just watched. It became this like really, really hopeful thing for me, right? Where it was like, wow, if in an environment like that for a three or four hour window, on mass, we can behave like that and put aside all of the things that out here kind of separate us. Like, could we use sports and sporting events to actually help some of the things that are the ills we deal with on a social basis outside of that environment? That, I think, is where I started to really 
find a sense of meaning and purpose in sports, right? It wasn't in winning a championship. That's cool. And it's really fun when you're winning. It's way more fun than when you're losing. But it was like, what else does sports have the power to do that we just don't pay attention to because we're so caught up in the emotional part of it, right? Um, and and that kind of put us on this whole journey to, you know, sort of the stuff that we're into today. Uh, that's a really long answer to your questions, by the way, but hopefully that's useful. You know, something I was thinking about as you were talking is you were observing the fans. You develop or, or gain data uh, from fans. Did you, how did, did you play a role in shaping that experience based on emotion. So you knew what triggers to kind of pull during the game. Like how, once you started observing all these insights, kind of what direction did that take you down once you became really interested in this? You know, initially it was about how we were going to produce events, right. And how we were going to make the content that we're going to run in events and, you know, those sorts of things. It was very sort of like all inside the building when a game was happening. And I think we got pretty good at that. Um, you know, there was a lot of things we created, right? Um, you know, like we joke around like the kiss cam. Um, it's just like a public display of affection is sort of an awkward thing, but everybody at the same time loves it. Do you know what I mean? So, and then you can play off the awkwardness by like putting two people up that you know are not there together. Right. So, uh, so we started having fun doing things like that. And then, you know, we started asking ourselves questions like, okay, well, we've done the kiss cam a lot. What if we brought improv actors in, we pre-filmed and pre-produced all the things that we think would be hilarious to happen on the kiss cam that probably are never actually going to happen. And so we started actually we brought, you know, 50, 60 actors in uh, all from this improv troupe. And we set the building up and cameras up so that, you know, everything looked like a game condition. And then what we would do is during the game, we would go to kiss cam and we'd shoot a live shot, live shot. And then we would drop in one of these preset videos. People just absolutely like exploded laughing with all of these different kind of like scenarios. And it, it another thing started to dawn on me at this point, which was, in this space, people are willing to suspend disbelief, um, which is a really powerful thing too, because it's so emotional in that moment. And that's what they've come for. Really, we noticed this because we had a couple of these things that we shot that were like so successful. We were like, oh, we got to use that again, but let's wait a couple of weeks. Right. And hopefully we'll have sort of like a different enough crowd that they won't remember that we played this one a couple of weeks earlier. And we played it and they responded exactly the same way. And I was looking around going, wait a minute, those are season ticket holders that were at that last game and they're laughing just as hard. And then they started sort of doing stuff. We were watching them like they were almost like prepping somebody on like what was about to happen. And then you could see them sort of sit back and watch. And then the person would laugh and they'd be like, ah, that was great, right? Like, so it was almost like they were socializing this person on what the coming experience was going to be. And that was sort of another really interesting turning point because that's when we started thinking like, okay, we should be doing this for our sponsors, right? So instead of just putting a sign up or putting a logo up or reading a PA announcement, like, what if we actually designed a brand partner into this kind of experience? And then that led to us working very, very closely with our sponsorship group. And then, you know, in the end, Brian, we really sort of built an internal agency that was just taking this kind of thinking and this sort of, as you said, observation and translating it into, you know, how do we actually commercialize and, and monetize this for, for the business? And that became very much a real thing. It just kept expanding from there, right? So we started getting into like, okay, if people are feeling a certain way during games, like uh, even though we're losing, can we build that into sort of this notion of product and ticket product? And how does that change the calculus of the value of a ticket? And by the way, like Disney, I came to realize and figured this out like years and years earlier, right? They had their own version of this. And there's some other really, really smart companies that were, you know, I would say quietly doing this because 
obviously it had taken them whatever time it had taken them to figure this out and bake it into their business. And it was a part of their strategic advantage. Um, and so we were just kind of finding our own kind of like version of that. And then looking at more and more parts of the business to say, how do we take more of this refined view and this process and then impact another piece of the business. So it made its way into retail. It made its way into, you know, sort of all of these other elements. And then finally, you know, I guess we got far enough down the road with it. It allowed us to sort of like step away from a franchise and actually just start working in our own business, just doing this. I think it's, it's the level of depth and thinking as I've shared with you is just uh, remarkable. Uh, and I think something you do so well one of the things that, you know, when I was getting to know you in my early years in sports was you were, you were responsible for a large piece of the Atlanta Hawks rebrand. You know, you're talking a lot right now about these observations that you took from fans and how that drove the experience and then how maybe you brought that into sponsors. And then it sounds like in time, you, you finally said, let's look a little inward at the brand. We have all these outward observations and insights. How do we shape our brand to connect to the audience? And I don't want to put words in your mouth and say that was the, how you arrived there. But when did you notice, hey, we need to we need to transform the Hawks brand? Like what what was the impetus that said, wow, we have some shifts we need to make as an organization? You know, as as we were figuring out more and more how to commercialize this, that also gave me a different level of exposure to other areas of the business. And I started to really learn kind of how other areas of the business worked. At that time, the two biggest revenue streams, I think of any sports franchise, you know, ticketing and sponsorship. You have to sort of park broadcast. Broadcast is obviously a huge piece, but it's a little different because there's a lot more revenue certainty on the broadcast side. You get your regional broadcast deal done. It's probably a 10 year deal. You know what you're getting no matter what. Um, that, that was sort of like on a shelf, but you know, ticketing and sponsorship a lot more tactical, right? Like we would be going into, hey, it's Wednesday night. We've got like 4,000 tickets left to sell. Um, and it's kind of like that airline model, like that plane's taking off. And if there's 50 empty seats on the plane, we don't get to sell them again, right? Not for that flight, we don't. And that became really interesting too, to sort of say like, wow, how do we take all this kind of thinking and help solve that? And ultimately, I think what we came to realize after we spent some time on it was at that time, the Hawks were, were doing a lot of these sort of NBA best practices as it related to ticket sales. And the team was actually winning. They had been losing for a long time, but at this point they had started to win and they were kind of going to the playoffs. But the revenue metrics were not proportionate or catching up to the winning on the court. That's when, you know, I started to you know, build this hypothesis that we had a more systemic issue, right? This wasn't that we were just tactically not doing things right, or we needed a different marketing slogan or, do you know what I mean? There was something deeper that was going on that was a problem. And, and after two years of this, you know, initially everyone sort of thought it was just lag, like, oh, we need to be winning for a while. And some people haven't realized because we haven't been relevant enough that, you know, they just haven't realized we're good. Uh, because a lot of the philosophy in sports is, and this is also true, but like, you know, when you win, people come and when they come, they spend money. And when you don't win, they don't spend money and you're in this down period. And I was like, well, how do we make, you know, the lows a little higher and the highs a little lower? Because if I owned this business, like I would want the predictability of that, right? I wouldn't want to be subject to these big highs and lows because winning has a lot to do with variables I'm not in control of. Like, can I go get the big free agent, right? Maybe I have the money, but he doesn't like the city I live in. You know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot of control over that. You know, did we draft well? Like, I have no control over that. Um, and even if we drafted well, did we develop players well? So it was kind of like, can this business really be that contingent on variables like that, that the business has very little control over? There's got to be a different way. And this is where we kind of came back to this whole emotive space and wanted to understand, like, is that really what fans get out of this, right? Do they only get something out of it when we win? Um, and the short answer to that was no, that's not true. 
And so we started looking at the brand. Uh, I did not consider myself a brand guy at that time. Um, I had to frankly do a lot of reading about what brand is and how brands work. And I would not profess to you that I came in as like a brand specialist on something like this. But we were bringing that viewpoint, that very humanistic curiosity to understand what are the needs that are getting met right now that people are willing to irrationally spend money on? If I could understand that, we could really kind of maybe reposition the business around that understanding. There was a research methodology that we used. Uh, it's very, I would say, focused on cultural anthropology and it studies conversation. And, you know, the idea was if we could really understand what people were talking about in the market when they were talking about us, and I don't mean like scraping social media, like just looking at Twitter, because that's more monitoring. And we were looking for something much, much deeper than that, that that would allow us to sort of um, break those conversations down. And, you know, we were using linguistic algorithms to like grab these conversations, bottle them, break them down, study them by sentiment, study them by even sentence structure and the terms that people used and what was the associated meaning of the terms they used. I got to tell you, like, ultimately, at the end of it, there was really only four big findings that came out. And, and Brian, we looked at like 1.7 million conversations in a 12 month period. Okay. Um, and there was over 3 billion conversations that were available to be studied. They didn't meet the criteria of what we were looking at. Okay. And we contrasted this against three other cities. So we looked at the Dallas Mavericks and the 76ers, and we looked at the Washington Wizards because we wanted to have contrasting DMAs to really try to understand this if we could get to the bottom of it. What was shocking to me at the time um, was the number one finding, meaning out of 1.7 million conversations, the number one topic that people talked about was how they didn't trust the organization and they didn't trust the brand. They didn't talk about players. They didn't talk about owners. They talked about not trusting the organization and not trusting the brand. And that was like too benign for me, right? Like a little too abstract. And so when we started like kind of drilling down deeper, one of the things that was sort of the impetus of this lack of trust was that the market still very much resented the Hawks for trading Dominique Wilkins and the way they traded him and where they traded him literally generations of Atlantans had socialized each other and kind of like the next generation, like this is why you shouldn't like this team. Because if you think about it, right, there was a whole era of little boys and girls who had Neek's poster on the back of their door, right? Like he was the guy and he was like who you were going to emulate and all that kind of stuff. At the end of his career, towards the end of his career, he was very unceremoniously shipped off to um, the Clippers, who everybody knew at that time was a bad organization, not just a bad team, a bad organization. So he was sent to like the Siberia of the NBA. What we got in return was like Danny Manning and a bag of dirty socks. So the replacement for what Neek meant to all those people who grew up with Neek, like Danny Manning never had a chance. Do you know what I mean? Like it had nothing to do with Danny Manning and his ability or his inability. He was never going to replace what Neek meant to those people. Neek meant more to people than just being a basketball player and a great dunker, right? Like that's the part that teams I think often miss. They think that, the athlete only represents sort of like athletic prowess to fans. And that is a hundred percent not true, right? That's why fans love human interest stories. They want to know like, how did that player grow up and who's his mom and what was his dad like? And does he have brothers and sisters and who are his coaches or her coaches? And like, we want to know those stories because we want to know the person. We don't want to know those stories simply because that's going to explain their athletic ability. That put a huge piece in place for me in terms of like, that was a wow moment. That was a like, holy cow. 
you know, this thing has been sitting kind of like under our nose the entire time. And we were totally oblivious to this. And, you know, the other big finding that, uh, by the way, you can imagine what it's like going into a board of, you know, the, the ownership team board of directors and explaining to them, you know, we just did this huge study that they funded. And oh, by the way, the number one thing that came back is the market doesn't trust us, right? And they're all financial guys. They're all sort of hedge fund guys, right? So this notion of like, what does that even mean, Peter, right? Like they don't trust us. And it kind of sounds like BS. Because uh, they're very rational thinkers, right? Because they're private equity guys and you know financiers. There was a, another finding that was as remarkable in a different way. And as a guy who did not grow up in the market, okay, and really did not grow up an NBA fan at all. I remember, I'm Canadian. I grew up a hockey guy. So to me, the NBA like basically didn't exist until I got to Atlanta. The study came back, and there was just all this conversation about these people named tree and Mookie and Neek and Doc. And I was like, what the hell does nobody have a first name? Like what, what is going on? Right? Like, and these are players who haven't played for us in like 15 years, yet there's all of this reoccurring current conversation. And then it became really clear how much fans romanticize the past. That's why the Neek finding started to make even more sense. But the other piece of this that also became really clear from a branding perspective, when you bestow a nickname on somebody, you really move out of a place of formality in your relationship and into something much, much more personal. And it's a symbol of trust. That was also an indication that at that time and in that era when those players played, there was a lot of trust in the franchise, even though the franchise actually was winning more in the period when I was doing this than this romanticized era when everything just seemed to be like uh, cotton candy clouds. And you know what I mean? Like, and I, I have one of our PR guys actually went back and did the work. And like our winning percentage at that time was less with that team than it was with like the Joe Johnson, you know, Al Horford, Jeff Teague era. Um, so it was like, wow, wait a minute, how is that even possible? But again, it came back to this notion of trust and all of the sort of emotional connection that people feel to, you know, the sports teams and the things that they're fans of that they love. And so that's what we really rebranded the Hawks around. That's why we brought back that old Pac-Man era mark. It was because that mark was actually symbolic of a time in Hawks history when there was all this positive emotion around the brand. So we didn't just bring it back as a retro mark. We brought it back and we said, okay, we need to let the retro mark speak to that era and those players. Let's kind of modernize the mark a little bit so that it can have the same effect and it can elicit that same euphoric recall, but let's do it in a way that this team and this era can own it. And these fans and this era can own that this mark belongs to them. And so that got into, that's the same premise of, you know, uniforms, colors, um, by the way, ATL, because we were the first Atlanta team to, cl to claim ATL. I know all the others do now, or the A, and, and that's great. But ATL came about because ATL is the nickname for the city of Atlanta, right? So it was like, well, if everybody loves nicknames and this is what they represent it, then we need to give ourselves a nickname and what better nickname to give than to be representative of the nickname that comes with the city. So that's where true to Atlanta came from. And this whole idea that this is a team that's not going to so much be about itself. It's going to be more a representation of the city and the people of the city, which was a bit of a paradox, right? From a brand strategy perspective. Um, but, you know, we were really proud and, and felt like it was really well received and, uh, and that's how we ended up in all of that space. I felt like the rebrand just being down there at the time, it brought back so much excitement in the community. And there's just this new life uh, to the organization and how they showed up. You know, the gift of being able to have the freedom to create a new process, I will always credit the Hawks ownership and, you know, uh, Steve Coonan at that time, he came in sort of partway through it, but he as a new CEO could have shut that whole thing down. You know what I mean? 
And not only did he not shut it down, he challenged me to push it further. And so the, again, and I, and I don't say this, you know, to be trite, but the gift of having that sort of support, no one had really kind of gone about it in that way before. Right. And, and I didn't have kind of like a book to say, this is the manual we're following to do this. It was sort of like, these are the things we've learned. These are the things we believe in. Uh, we believe really, really deeply in them, but we're not a hundred percent sure that this is going to work, but here's all the reasons why we think it's going to, uh, and to have them say, yeah, keep going. Um, let's keep spending money on this. Right. Um, was that's just not lost on me and it never will be. Uh, and frankly, that process, and we've refined it even since then is what we have built, you know, today's business from, you know, the, the last piece of the rebrand that sometimes doesn't get sort of acknowledged as much as we were better understanding fandom, right. And sort of this, like, what is it, how does it get created and how does it come undone and how do we do more of it? The, the sort of, you know, hypotheses, and there was some research out there that, that, you know, supported this was that, you know, obviously fandom shows up in other places other than sports, right? It shows up in music and it shows up in fashion and food and technology and travel and these other spaces. And music is a huge part of what makes Atlanta, Atlanta. And so that's why we reached out to the hip hop community because it was such a sort of like sincere part of Atlanta's DNA and such a unique thing that when we were actually going through the uniform design, um, TI and 2 Chains, and, you know, there were some artists like that big boy, you know, they were actually in working with us, reviewing the designs we were coming up with. And we also, you know, were thinking, man, if we could layer fandom, wouldn't that be amazing, right? Like sports fandom and music fandom. And those guys really bought into that. And that's why, you know, we were able to get them to perform at games because that was not a normal thing back then, right? And we did these retail collaborations where they would perform at a game and then we would work together with them and design a commemorative t-shirt to go with it. And uh, it was a labor of love. It was a lot of work, but I will also say it was a huge amount of fun because everybody was part of the discovery kind of like together. And we were trying things and seeing how it worked and then, you know, to have artists like that, that were like sort of part of that. And they were, you know, bringing their feedback and their ideas. And it was kind of like a unicorn time of my career in terms of like those, like, I don't know, you could go remake that time again, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, and we also had players very actively engaged, like, you know, Cal Corver and, and at that time, Horford and Paul Millsap and Jeff Teague, like when we were putting the uniforms together, like we would go down to the locker room and show them stuff, you know what I mean? And show them colors. And um, at one point we were going to have a full shoulder on, on our Jersey. Uh, Kyle Corver pulled it on and then went out and, and, you know, took a couple shots on the court and he came back and he's like, we're not actually doing this, are we? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh man, like the, having the full shoulder totally pulls on my arm when I try to take a jumper. And he, and I was like, no, no, we're just experimenting with this. Of course, we're going to have a strap. Like, don't be crazy. Right. <laughs> so, you know, those guys really deserve a lot of credit for, you know, what was created and then sort of what was created on top of that. And, and I think there are a lot of very talented people at the Hawks who have kind of kept building on all of that in their own way. Right. Um, you know, they just released the Peachtree Jersey again. Um, it's awesome. Right. And it connects to the show Atlanta. And do you know what I mean? So what's really fun now, even though I haven't been involved in that for some time, is that foundational work. Other people have, you know, brought sort of their energy and passion to and their thinking. And while it's really cool for business, to me, what's maybe most gratifying is, you know, what the fans get out of that, what the city gets out of that. And this notion that, you know, it, it's really become a franchise that's focused on bringing people together. That's just, you know, I guess if I was putting a bow on the whole purpose and meaning thing we were talking about earlier, for me to be able to sit back and passively in the background, see that stuff happening is, is awesome. Yeah. 
Well, your your legacy, you know, the legacy of what you built uh, and with others has been carried forward, right? Even without you there, and the foundation is being built upon, uh, in what sounds like a super meaningful way. So, I really appreciate you you sharing and how it connects to your therapy journey. And then we have you know a bit of time left, but um, Peter, I think what you've gone on to do is fascinating because now you've you've taken a body of life's uh, your let's say your life's work of over the last 20, 30 years. And you've put it together with what you're doing today. So with some of the time we have left, I'd just love for you to give an overview of, of, of what you're doing or why you're doing it and, and how you're bringing together everything you've learned to now maybe give those gifts away to others in a more scalable, but also boutique uh, way so that results are recreated. You know, to your point, we've just tried to keep building on, you know, what we had learned and um, the fandom piece was, you know, a huge, huge component. Um, when we got again more into the commercial side of it, we got really interested in behavioral economics, the study and all the work that's gone into behavioral economics. How would that sit kind of like next to what we had learned about fandom? Um, and then I got exposed through the process, actually during the rebrand, to a writer named Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan at that time had written a book called The Righteous Mind. And the righteous mind is uh, really largely about moral foundation theory and about understanding people's instincts and how we operate off of instinct and instincts actually measurable. And, you know, if you sort of understand how someone is instinctually orientated or like the lens they see the world through is based on, you know, basically how they score against five instincts that you can really bring some predictability about how they're going to respond to whether it's messaging or brands or content or, you know, political platforms and all these different things. So we got really, really interested in that and how we could bring those three things together, which, you know, we feel uh, really good about how we've done that and built a process around that. What we apply it against has also gotten bigger, which has been really fun, right? So we still do a lot of brand work and, in, in, you know, we get to work in sort of like clean energy today and in CPG and, you know, we still work in sports, by the way, because, you know, we're a glutton for punishment. We just kind of like can't get away from it because it's sort of who we are. But we started to bring those three pieces together in this process um, to things like airports, and big multimodal transportation hubs, and then to cities, um, and now even to counties and whole counties. And we started bringing it into architecture and starting to work with architects to sort of bring this kind of, not just the observational insights, but sort of the research insights that bring more volume or quant volume to a very sort of qual process to say, could we be designing buildings differently? right? Based on how we know emotion sort of drives people's decision making and how they feel in spaces. So of course, that started in the sports environment, we work with sports architects, um, to start redesigning, you know, stadiums and, um, and uh, arenas, and ballparks. And then that started translating into like, well, is that really any different than how people feel in an airport? Right? Um, and is that any different in how they might feel in an entertainment district? Um, which would include offices and retail. And again, been really, really fun because the gravity of it feels even bigger, but the process is exactly the same, Brian. You know, we have to be um, even more thoughtful and, and sort of like methodical about how we deliver the process because what's at stake is even bigger. But the red thread, even when we're talking about doing this with a city and a county, is just people. And which is no different than when we were watching fans at a hockey game or at a basketball game. I would tell you that for me, that sense of meaning and purpose is even bigger as well, because you're you're potentially able to impact an even broader swath of, of people and the world. You know, I was one part of that rebrand strategy, and maybe I drove components of it and you know, um, led certain pieces of it. But, you know, that has, as you said, continued to go on. Legacy, I don't know that I would have fixed that word for me, 
because really I just want to be known for what my daughters remember, not what anybody else remembers really. Cause I don't think anyone's building statues to me. And I certainly don't feel like I need anything like that. Right. But if you can give people the tools to understand things differently, which allows them to apply their energy and thinking differently, then I didn't do that. I just maybe put them onto the tools or exposed to them to a different way to think about things. Then they went and did it. And that to me is, is again, sort of like where the magic and all of it rests, right? I would take you all the way back to the very beginning when we're talking about that young person who's, you know, trying to reconcile that they're a drug addict and an alcoholic. I'm not fixing them, right? All I'm trying to do is carry a message to them, show them some tools, show them potentially how to use those tools, and then they're going to go off and either use them and change their life or not. Just like in this environment, we're now sort of like working with, you know, mayors and, um, you know, judge executives and, and sort of like uh, county commissioners and people like that to introduce them to tools to drive economic development and, you know, development just for human flourishing sort of uh, with their constituencies that they're going to do it. We're not doing it. We're only facilitating. That's really what our job is, right? Is to be a facilitator of that, which frankly also takes all the pressure off of us where we can just go in and really do what we believe very, very deeply in and be passionate about it, but not feel like the outcome hinges on whether we did a good job of it or we didn't do a good job. Just like that story I told you that was so jarring in the very, very beginning of this, right? Um, that honestly had very little to do with me. That had everything to do with him and the decisions he made. And I was frankly, probably not a part of that at all. Uh, and I would tell you that today, totally different context, same effect, right? Uh, very positive things at this much, much bigger sort of level, only a facilitator. What you did for the Hawks, what you did for that one person or the many people you worked in the therapeutic center, that thread that you've carried through, I think throughout your career, uh, and now bringing it to life in a bigger way. I think find it really fascinating. It's neat, right? Because if you put in that foundational work, you're going to be able to impact millions of people who step foot in those arenas, uh, cities, airports, buildings to come. Uh, I just got to say, I think the way you've you've thought about this is beyond fascinating and hopefully others carry uh, your torch forward beyond this when it's all said and done. So thank you for everything and showing up. Anything else that you just want to say or give life to that I didn't touch on? Uh, well, I'm going to say something personal between you and I, if that's okay. I would also say, well, it's fun to work at sort of like the, the level of the projects that we are, you know, sort of allowed to work on today. I think there are so many small things we can be doing for each other. It only takes a quick moment to acknowledge somebody ask them how they're really doing. Do you know what I mean? Not just the, how you doing? Oh, okay, good. And then move on. Maybe just acknowledging somebody makes them feel less invisible for a moment. Mm -hmm. Our interaction all those years ago, um, you know, you're a college kid and I, I get this all the time. People are like, you know, why do you spend so much time talking to the interns? And I'm like, because they're awesome because they have energy and they're not jaded. And um, a, I get to feed off of that, but B, um, you know, I think when you have a moment with somebody like that and take an interest, you really don't know what's going to happen, right? Because it's this whole idea of like geometric progression. So I don't take any credit for your success, zero. Um, but it's so fun for me to sort of know where you were then and the things we were talking about and all the things you were wrestling with and trying to figure out what you were going to do and how you're going to you know, use your university experience and all that kind of stuff to then be where we are today, um, not just on a podcast together, having this really fun conversation, but to see you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, out, you know, working with other people, helping them build their businesses and, you know, reconcile things in their own lives and world. So, you know, the big stuff is like super fun and it's awesome to talk about. But to me, the real nut is always in the mono a mono and like, do we still take enough time when we can, right? Mm -hmm. To acknowledge another human being, take an interest in them because we all have something to give. We, we absolutely all do, right? And I know the currency kind of in this world, often we trade in money as the currency, but people have wisdom, they have time, they have, you know, they have all these other things in abundance 
that they can be generous with. And you just really don't know what that is, you know, is going to potentially do for somebody else. I, I would say, you know, if nothing else, that's the thing I try to keep coming back to is, you know, success is awesome and it's fun and it's all this great stuff. But uh, is it really anything if we're not doing those kind of things? Right. Uh, I, I think for me, the answer is no. Nicely said. And uh, thank you for that. And I think you're right, though. It's those thousands and thousands of little moments and encounters of taking interest in others that add up that enable the big things to happen. Uh, and so connecting with people and engaging in a caring way uh, can create tremendous outcomes uh, in a very positive direction. So thank yeah. you. Peter, where, where can people find you, reach out to you, learn more about you and SEER? Uh, well, they can find us on our website, which is just SEER, S-E-E-R dot world, no dot com. It's just SEER dot world. Um, and they can certainly feel free to reach out to me vis-a-vis -vis email. Very simply, Peter at SEER dot world. I'd be happy to connect with anybody who found this even mildly fascinating. <laughs> I think it was more than mildly fascinating, but uh, it sounds good. Peter, this was uh, an honor to do this with you and uh, so excited for what's ahead for you. And uh, it's so good to reconnect. Indeed. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thank you for joining me on The One Away Show. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Have a one-away moment you'd like to share? Follow me on Twitter or Instagram at BrianWish underscore. Or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me about the moment that altered your life. The One Away Show is produced by ArcBound a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs, experts, and visionaries launch authentic personal brands. From message development to podcast production, social media content generation, and book writing, we work with you to create your arc. Head to arcbound.com to learn more. Thank you for listening, and please join me next time on The One Away Show.